Gotcha. So we're allowed to change who we are and what we like or the boundaries that we did or didn't have up in the past and the expectations that other people have around our change. You know, like people have this idea of what a trajectory is going to be. And if we go a different trajectory, it's like people have opinions about it. Right. So like in grad class, we were actually watching a video the other day. And the thing that caught me was that they were interviewing some teachers about a kid in the class that was behaviorally challenging. And they showed a clip of the teacher pulling the kid aside and the teacher being like, oh, you're not that kid that I knew last year. So like, where did that kid go? That sort of thing. And I'm sure people have had those experiences where they're like, oh, where did that sweet little person go that I used to know and you're so different now and it's almost in a way of saying I preferred that version of you before Mm -hmm. so it's hard to hear that because it's like well this is me I can't really go back I don't really know I don't really want to go back Um, and you might not have realized you liked me when I was in people pleaser mode so of course you liked me like that Mm mm-hmm yeah. And th- so there was an article on weight and fat people and obesity and how society pretty much is all wrong about their judgments of that. And there was a moment where uh, one of the people who was interviewed, and we'll link this article, but one of the people was interviewed and commented about how she was able to lose some weight, which of course, you know, we know that weight gain and weight loss and whatnot, like it, it's so much more complicated. But anyway, dieting doesn't work. Starving ourselves doesn't work, but we might get temporary loss if our body is literally falling apart and consuming itself from the inside out, which is definitely far from healthy. So this person went to their doctor and basically told the doctor, I'm restricting really badly. And the doctor was like, well, whatever you're doing to lose weight, it's working. So keep it up. (laughs) And that's so unhealthy. And yikes. Yeah. So this, I wanted to make this connection and bring that up because you know, where did that kid go that used to be so good? Well, chances are something happened to that kid. And by asking that question, you're potentially subjecting that kid to have flashbacks to what happened for why they've changed. There could be abuse happening. It could be, you know, malnutrition happening. It could be uh, a sudden diagnosis that's cropping up. Like we don't know why people change when they do. And it's not ours to comment or place value on who they are, uh, now or who they could be or who they were in the past, just like commenting on that person in the article losing weight. Like the doctor was not fully acknowledging everything that went into that before they made that comment. So uh, I think that we really just need to support people in whatever they need. And that's how we get better. That's how we come together as a species and as a planet these assumptions that say someone is going to stay who they are in this moment forever is really harmful because that staticness, that stuckness that people experience when they are exactly the same all the time is often a result of other people having placed expectations on them and them conforming to this sort of prison. Yeah. And I mean, that's really why, stepping into your authenticity can be like the hardest thing for some people like oh i'm used to the feeling of people pleasing and i know that if i step into things that i like for me and that's not for the sake of people pleasing what sort of reaction am i going to get from people Mm -hmm. our fear of other people's reactions is really this prison that we need to release we need to step into that authenticity and know that we are okay as we are, we need to shift from supporting expectations of others thinking we're going to be a certain way to allowing ourselves to be that authenticity. You know, it's, it's our job to take care of ourselves and step away from conformity to acknowledge our own inner self. And if someone's trying to force us to be a version of us that that we don't want to be like that's not healthy and on the same token if someone's coming to us in pain and asking for support we need to be able to show up for them and support them without conforming trying to get them to conform to expectations of what we might think is appropriate for them right yeah and i mean we also have the you know 
if the change is harming the other person, then we're not saying like if you've noticed the change in someone and you can tell that it's harming them, like for example, they're restricting a ton of like food from them and losing weight and you can tell that like they've lost a few pounds, but like there are other things that are they're struggling with because they're not getting enough nutrients in their body and like the not saying that you need to like shame them or like extra cause them to conform or anything but like checking in with them and just seeing how they are doing because and not like in a pressuring sort of way right not trying to get them to be a certain way we can say hey are you doing all right without saying hey you need to change what you're doing basically yeah i mean that's that's kind of what the biggest thing is if we're thinking about the present moment of where people are currently just being able to not necessarily compare them to their past selves or pressuring them into a future self that they might not fit in. Like just accepting them as they currently are and being a support to them and however they need to, because all of us already live with that pressure of like, what am I going to do tomorrow? How am I going to better myself? Or you can look back at like a project you did when you were younger and you could be like, Oh, I wish I was in that creative spirit or mood that I am now, or you know, that like can pull us away from the present moment and what we can do to grow and enjoy ourselves now. And those pressures are what impact mental health and emotion and all of that stuff. Mm -hmm. And on that note, even though we might have these past parts that we're no longer interfaced with, we can establish a connection with those old parts of us and offer healing to see if they want to be integrated into the now or if we've moved beyond it. And As an example, I've been doing a lot of work lately around my wounded artist part. So I was hugely into art in high school. Uh, I started in middle school. I think it was sixth grade that I started to get into art. But high school, I was kind of known for my grade as the school artist because my paintings were always in the hall and I was in a lot of county shows, several galleries. Now (laughs) I'm in no shows, no galleries. I don't even paint regularly. I used to paint like at least a painting a day, if not multiple projects at a time going on and lived in the art classroom for three out of seven periods of the day, plus my lunch. So I'm not, I'm not in that part of me anymore. That was sort of the forward one during that life period because I was going through a lot of trauma and it was a major coping skills skill for me. So that part of me went into hiding and now I'm trying to bring them out and do the healing work Because I do think that that part still wants to be around and wants to explore again. But I'm not going to achieve that by being like, ugh, Safriana, how can you not be painting? Like, you had such potential and you just gave up. And all this time you've not been painting is wasted time. So I'm not going to paint if I do that because I'm bullying myself. Instead, if I go in with, okay, I know that this wound occurred in my past and that's who I used to be. Does she want any ground in my life right now? Does she want to come out and explore? Allowing there to be an opportunity in a no pressure setting to just put a canvas on the table, slap paint on it when I feel like, but no pressure. There's no need to be productive with it. There's no need to try and force myself back to where I used to be. So basically, if we want to reincorporate parts of who we used to be because we lost sight of them due to pain or trauma, we can come in from a non-bullying place. But we're never going to be exactly who we used to be. And I wanted to talk about, you know, how we deal with other people's responses to us changing because it is a big thing. Uh, If I were to step back into my artist self now, most people that are in my circle would probably be pretty supportive. But if I had tried to step into that fully, maybe five, six, seven years ago, people might have been like, what are you? What are you doing? Who does that? <laughs> you know, I didn't have the the circle of support that I do now. So not only are you allowed to change, but you're allowed to check in with your network, with your supports, with your loved ones, and see, are they team you or are they team their idea of you? Because even if we change, when it comes down to love, if we love someone because of who they are, it shouldn't really matter what they're doing, as long as it's what they want to do. If we're coming in from an egoic place of you can only do what I want you to do, then that's not actually love of the other person. Yeah. And I love what you said of, you know, checking in with your loved ones and see if they're team you or if they are team their idea of you. Like that's such a powerful message. Um, And it can be hard sometimes when 
we as humans like consistency and control, like having the realization that our loved ones are going to change and could cause them to be different than what we are used to can be hard because, you know, you and I have been in a relationship since 2018. So about three and a half years ago, Mm -hmm. (laughs) uh, we have so many anniversaries in there too. Um, yeah, just so many, so many different things happened in that time. We, because we rapid fired and started dating, moved in together, talked about getting engaged, then had other forms of commitment coming up. Oh, yeah. There were just so many. And the timeline is hilarious. But the thing is, like, most people will have the honeymoon phase, which will last like a couple months to a year and a half at most. And that is when you're doing a lot of positive projection on the other person and your best foot forward. And you have a lot of these happy brain chemicals that are floating in your system <laughs> because it wants you to procreate. Yay, biology. Yay, biology. <laughs> but at the same time, you might get into this rhythm of how much romance is involved, how much intimacy is involved, how you frame your life for those first couple of months. And then things will shift where maybe you need to, uh, you know, like you've put your life on pause to extra get this to know this person. And then you have to get back into the real world. And then, like, because of that the amount of time you were spending with them was not really sustainable when balancing the rest of your life. And so we started to realize that and our role shifted a lot in the past couple of years. Like at first it was like lovers and partners and now it's like we're fellow therapists, consultants, business partners, legally and financially bound house owners. Like we have all of these other roles that some of our time together is spent on. And then we have other types of quality time used for other romantic roles, but you know, we still spend a lot of time together, but they're just a lot different than what it used to be. And mm-hmm. if I had the expectation that I only wanted our roles to be like schmoopsy romantic love, um, and then having it, it, it evolve into this, like it's different. And thankfully, a lot of the change when you're living with someone is gradual. So it's not like a slap in the face, that immediate change. Right. But, you know, sometimes I remember. I would look back and be like, oh, yeah, I remember when we were first dating and this, this or this would be happening more often. And you can advocate for that, too. Like, if you see that adding more things or wanting something else or something more in the relationship is potentially doable in your schedule, um, then you can absolutely ask for that, like, you know, and request that with your with your partner or friend or whatever and see if they're on board with that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And all of this makes me think of the lessons that we learn through being polyamorous about communication and, and time allotment and things like that. You know, you were speaking about the advocacy, like, Hey, if I want this with my partner, I need to say that even if your partner or you are going through changes, you're still allowed to communicate. Uh, If your child's going through changes, you're still allowed to communicate for connection, not for the purpose of changing them. Not for the purpose of being worried about the direction that they're taking. Again, if it's something that's truly aligned with their joy, not if they're going down like a dark path, like suicide. And and by that, I mean suicidality or self-harm or like heavy drug use or something, literally something that could take their life. Not some lifestyle choice that you disagree with or, uh, you know, a personality shift or a boundary that they're suddenly setting. Uh, But we're allowed to talk about those things. And going back to sort of that dark path, like you don't have to be on board for a loved one doing something that's genuinely harming them, but you can support them by asking again, like what's going on? What do you need? Um, (laughs) Let's say your partner says something like I'm miserable in my job and this is eating my soul alive. I feel like I'm dying, but maybe you're nervous about finances, but why would you make your partner stay in a job that they're absolutely miserable in right that doesn't make sense uh this is a case where there's something in their highest good and you're going to make it work if it's your child they're coming out as queer you make it work you can still advocate for quality time in the midst of their changes but you can't determine what someone else does with their time their body their personality right i mean uh you know thinking about the example of like the jobs like the quote-unquote making it work like we understand some people like you're looking at your finances and you're like, there's absolutely no way that I can make this work. And so we just want to like, we understand that society has caused a lot of financial burdens on people that makes capitalism. 
But that just makes it really hard for us to be able to, you know, quit our jobs and, and do a different thing, sort of like, you know. Right. But there's probably definitely a different way to approach that that can be a lot healthier. Like, okay, I see that this this job is murdering you literally, like you are so miserable. Let Can I support you in starting to look for another job mm-hmm. versus like, no, you have to stay in that job forever because it's making ends meet. Right. Like, yeah. Again, like supporting from support. Yeah. Supporting them in the concept of looking for other jobs and understanding that, you know, they might have to stay in the job a little while longer, but then, uh, you know, all of all of that stuff. Um, so going back to advocacy. Yeah. So the whole thing in terms of advocacy and requests, like we can request from people different things like, Hey, can I have a little bit more of your time? Can we do this thing together? And they're allowed to say no, like absolutely allowed to say no. And that's the thing that people get caught up on. Like I've noticed, um, with parents and like teens might be pushing back and parents might be like, this is what I want for you. And the teens like, no. And they're like, you don't (laughs) understand what you're good. You're, you know, going to experience if you don't say yes to this. And I was like, yeah, maybe they won't understand, but uh, forcing them into a path that they're not really, like, wanting to go into is only going to cause resentment. Mm-hmm. And, like, they're not going to truly invest time into, you know, what – because it's not what they're wanting to do. Right. Like, I remember my path going back to grad school, and I had gone to grad school before. Like, I applied to an online grad school, and my parents helped financially a little bit, and I was miserable. And I made this choice myself, like – but and even so, like, I was miserable with that choice and I dropped out and I lost money. And a little while later, I was like, I want to go back to grad school for a different major. And they were like, uh, you know, you don't have money for it. Like, uh, you know, it was at that point where I was at the age that I wasn't going to be able to use their insurance anymore. So it was like, you know, they were saying, how about you get a factory job that you can move up the ladder and have full time wages and get all the insurance plan through the company and all that stuff. And I'm like... That's not what I wanted to do. Mm-hmm. You would have been absolutely miserable. Yeah. And the thing is, like, they were seeing me like, oh, insurance, full-time pay, stuff on resume, etc. And I'm like, but none of that factory work is necessarily going to coincide with my goal. And yeah, I have student debt, but, like, most of us have that now. <laughs> <laughs> like, <laughs> oh, the great student loan debacle. Indeed. And, I mean, I'm way more aligned with what I want to do. So, you know, I probably would have dropped out of the factory work or just miserable i mean your health would have gone down yeah and you probably would have been miserable with me like that and it would have been a bad time for everyone (laughs) like i was severely stressed with grad school you know i just graduated and it have been picking up the pieces from the burnout um but at the end of the day i was like this is what i want to do it had specific meaning in it for you and I mean, I could say a lot about why we apply our lens to other people, but I think the most important thing is that people really need to come into understanding about how we make choices for ourselves, not for other people. Yeah. And I know that quote, the parents want the quote unquote best for their child. And, you know, there's also the thing of like, you know, I parents being like, I didn't have this opportunity when I was your age. So you're going to do this opportunity due to me not you know, like I can live vicariously through this. Mm -hmm. Um, But if your kid doesn't want that life, it's not their, you know, that's not their role. It's not their purpose to live the life that you never got to live. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, their role is experiencing life the way they want to experience life. So if your expectation was super prestigious Ivy League doctor and they're like, no, I actually have more passions towards other career paths that make less money. And I probably will be living more humbly than you'd expect me to. But that's okay. I don't need to live a life like a doctor, you know. Um, and like kids are exploring their life. Like they're going to have different interests than you more than likely. They probably will have some that overlap, but it's not a failing on your part. If they do struggle a little, if they are going out and they're like, you know, this is actually what I want to do. And they try it and they don't like it, or they're very indecisive uh, like three to 10 years of their life after high school, you know, people really do have to find themselves. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Like your twenties is not necessarily the time where you're like, 
I'm going to go to college and get a career I'll do forever and build my family with my high school sweetheart, <laughs> which I mean, some, some people, people do. Some people do that. Like I have, there are friends that I know that were like, I'm going to do this for your degree. I have my career. I'm starting my family and they are happy and awesome. And that works for them. Sweet. Uh, but if it doesn't work for you, like that's not like you haven't failed. Mm-hmm. Like you're not a failure for struggling and experimenting through that sort of stuff because in the end, like, you're going to be happier for it because you're figuring it out of what you actually want to do. And you're not doing it for the sake of other people. You're doing it for you. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. And, you know, we just, I kind of, and I just did an event through the Rise Leadership Circle, uh, Kayla Gata and Lisa Lamata. And I'm not going to give a lot of detail here because this is their proprietary information, but uh, they had something called a wealth code and just even flipping that to like a joy code or an essence code, like what makes you deeply you. And we all share common attributes, but just in different quantities. We're all creative. We're all compassionate. We're all uh, capable of confidence, etc. cetera. Right. And I think about it in masculine versus feminine versus androgynous energy. We all have a little bit of it all. You know, some people are super logical, some are super emotional, some are introverted, some are extroverted. And though the Rise Leadership's wealth code is totally different than that because it's based on on qualities, specific money related qualities, I, I just get really curious about the different makeups of people. And as you were talking about uh, parents, you know, I was thinking about your parents, I kind of, and just how their makeup, their recipe is different from the recipe of you. Your code is different. You go about things in a different way. But what many parents fall into the trap of is trying to apply their specific code onto their kids rather than nurturing their kids' own unique blueprint. Yeah. And I mean, like, we would usually say in my family, like, oh, like, I kind of so type B and my mom and dad are so type A. And type B was not really, like, wasn't good or mm-hmm. wasn't necessarily stated in that way, but it, it came across that way. Like, it would be better if you were type A because you'd get more done. You'd be a healthier weight because type B is more sedentary. Um, yeah. So. Yeah. And that's just not how everybody works. There's some people whose rhythm is sort of slow, slow, fast, slow, slow, fast, not fast, 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 fast crash (laughs) right and and that's not really healthy for for anyone but we all have a rhythm that works for us and we need room to authentically explore that right like you need to find your rhythm and that the biggest thing is like you can look up so many different ways to organize your schedule and everyone's way of organizing their schedule is different like there are night owls who do amazing work at two in the morning uh there's morning people that do amazing work at the crack of dawn there's you know for me i I know that I usually crash in the early afternoon. So like my brain is fuzzy and would make sense for me to do more movement during that time and not worry about like an intellectual stuff. So it's like learning more about how our brains and bodies work throughout the day allows us to better understand how we need to schedule our time. And we don't have to schedule it around like what other people, you know, would tell us to do. Like if you read somewhere that most people succeed with this prime schedule or something like that. Mm-hmm, but I'm not most people. Yeah. And then you're like, oh, no, I'm broken. Yeah. And, you know, I'm not normal. There's no normal. <laughs> I hate the concept of normal. Yeah. Uh, you know, this this concept of a code or a blueprint. Like, we each have this own unique just makeup that we get to decide and we get to figure out who we really are. Uh, but we struggle with that because we're immediately given the quote unquote programming of our parents right out of the gate. Right. Because I mean, the purpose of parenting is to teach your kids all that, you know? (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) I mean, that's what has been taught in society. Like, I'm not saying that that's what's currently happening right now. Like, you know, it's still kind of happening. So kind of, you know, there's this paradigm shift, but you know, with parenting, it's nurturing your kid, keeping them there safe keeping your kids safe and then allowing them to explore things on their own as well. Mm -hmm. Helping them figure out their own rhythms. Yeah. And I remember back when I was young, there was this whole thing of like being a mini me, like, you know, they just look at you uh, and like, you know, my mom and I would have similar hair and, you know, we both have brown hair, blue eyes. Like I, even though I was shorter than her, people just, they would always confuse us for some reason. I don't know why, like, did a 14 year old look like a 30 something year old? I don't know. But like those sorts of societal messages that just perpetuated the concept of like, oh, me becoming something that my parents wanted 
And it's like this thing is as parents, like there can be these ways that kids interpret how we act. Like, I don't think my parents ever explicitly verbatim said something about like me not following their expectations or needing to follow their expectations. Like I remember at certain times encouraging me to explore things that didn't really align with what like wasn't something that they did Mm -hmm. and to figure out who I, who I am. But there were also some of those messages that I contextualized like different responses or the way they reacted to different things or in the way they commented on other people, I would contextualize that to how I needed to be for them. Mm -hmm. And so like kids are really receptive to all of that different stuff. And, you know, we'll make conclusions on that without even mentioning it. Mm -hmm. And I want to say, like, you know, parents, you are trying your best and you aren't going to be perfect. So I get that. But, you know, I'm saying I'm contextualizing things my parents said in certain ways when I was a kid. I'm not really saying that they, like, emotionally harassed me about all that stuff, but, like... But even if their intention wasn't to, quote-unquote, emotionally harass you about stuff, our parents absolutely can still have the impact as if they are. And I think that's where awareness is so important raising our kids to be their their best self not our version of what we think their best self is yeah and that's scary because that's ultimately really relinquishing control right and uh you know there's a a metaphor that i want to bring up as we're sort of winding towards the end of our time today because it clicked for me the other day to the point where i made a tiktok about it you're on tiktok now yeah, I never thought that was going to happen, but I realized that there's like a lot of sound bites that happen in client sessions that would be really important for other people to hear. So I came up with this metaphor and I'm actually featuring it in a lot more detail in the House of Indico Publishing's um, Raising Wild Ones book, which no release date yet, but I kind of and I are both in that book. But the metaphor is that you are a garden and you get to plant plants that you want to plant. But sometimes weeds get in, and that's kind of where we are as adults. But what happens with parents? You know, parents fret about what their children's gardens are going to look like. So they go in and they start planting in there, and those plants might not actually flourish in their children's gardens. They might actually be weeds to them. But if we don't relinquish our control to children and we take over their garden space, we're forcing them to cultivate something that's not theirs. I think it's important for us to instead teach our children the skills needed to garden so that they can get to that point over time on their own and decide what they want to plant. Yeah. I mean, I'm just picturing like a parent teaching the kid how to make the garden plot and the parent is shoving their expectations on the kid. Like, you know, they, while the kid is at school or something like the parent goes and plants all of the parents favorite vegetables and flowers and everything and then the kid comes back and they're like okay johnny you're gonna water these now you know we're gonna prepare them and johnny is not interested in these plants he didn't choose them you know and the parent has done all of this work for the garden and is offended because they're like these are my favorite plants why doesn't johnny love them like if johnny doesn't want to cultivate them that this might mean that johnny doesn't love me um and, you know, I did all of this work. Is he not grateful for all of this work that I've done for him mm-hmm. versus you taking Johnny to the store with you to pick out the plants that he wants? And then he's more invested in watering the plants, you know, himself. Right. And the other thing to remember about gardening is that <laughs> some things are seasonal. Some are, you know, annuals versus perennials. And we have the power to choose to uproot certain things and plant new things in their place or bring back a plant that we used to have and give it a new pot and spruce it back up. We are in control. Our inner experience of our inner garden or inner system. Yeah. And I think that is awesome. Like, you know, if you're listening to this, I I would say it'd be really cool if you want to reflect on this specific metaphor, you know, like what's in your garden. Uh, Like you can make it metaphor or literal, like habanero peppers represent this part of my life and carrots represent this part of my life or (laughs) literal like here's a garden plot of music and a garden plot of work and a garden plot of whatever yeah and i think it would be really interesting to take it a step further and think about the garden that you currently have versus what you want to create what you want to cultivate and the percentage of (laughs) I'm looking at what I said last time and being like, "Hmm?" no, Um, I said that. Okay. Yeah. I was waiting for you to say, I'm growing up a whole course in my head right now. And then you just skipped. Yeah. 
because I don't want to go there. You don't want to go where? It, to the course. I'm skipping that. Oh, okay. Um, okay. Well, I will instead talk about that stuff then. Um, <clears throat> so, like, ultimately, you can also take it a step further. So you can say, you know, here's the garden plot that I currently have um, and I'm cultivating now, but maybe, like, you want to create your dream garden. So like have a garden plot of like, this is what I want my garden to look like. Um, and you know, the percentage of how much different, uh, vegetable, like certain vegetables take up certain parts of the plot, like 50% of the cucumbers of work end up taking, you know, the 10% of the sunflowers of play. And you're like, I want to change these percentages. Um, you know, and you also, you know, have to ask, like, was this garden that I have, was it created for something that I want or was it created in order to please what I thought other people wanted me to do? So how would you go about changing that garden? Mm -hmm. And you are allowed to change. And that's the core message of this episode, that even though you may have been someone else, in the past, you don't have to be that same self. Now you are allowed to change, to grow, to uproot, to replant, whatever you want to do. That is your right. And going back to the earlier parts of the episode where we talked about just normalizing other people's change and not putting your lens on that just remember that when we put our lens on other people, it's usually more of a reflection of us than it is of them. It's normally something that we're afraid of losing control or we're afraid that they're going to change and no longer appreciate who we are. Mm -hmm. So the more that we can validate each other's authenticity, the more that we can be compassionate around changes, the more we can just check in and tune in when we notice those changes happening to make sure that it's coming from an authentic place. I think we're going to land in a, in a much better place in society. Mm -hmm. And we're going to have a lot of awesome flourishing gardens because we actually want to, you know, work on them. Yes. Instead of a bunch of HOA gardens that look exactly the same. <laughs> yep. That only the HOA president takes care of because no one else actually wants to take care of it. <laughs> All right, bye. <laughs> <laughs>